Today on the Dr. Jeff Show, Dr. Jeff sits down with the author of Pure OCD, Chrissy Hodges. That's today here on the Zubia Live channel. Hello, I'm Shane Schultz, the executive producer of the Zubia Live channel. Zubia Live is your interactive live streaming video community specializing in health and wellness topics that affect you. You can always find us on our social media at Zubia Live or our website, ZubiaLive.com. Today, we have another great episode of the Dr. Jeff Show. Dr. Jeff is a board-certified psychologist and is well-known in the entertainment industry as well as his community. Dr. Jeff, it's great to have you here today. Thank you, Shane, for that great introduction. Hello, all, and welcome to the show. We want to hear your voice, your thoughts, your questions on today's topic, so make sure you post your comments on Facebook or Twitter at Zubia Live, or you can email me at drjeff at zubialive.com. Today, our topic is OCD, oy, obsessive compulsive disorder. Millions of people are affected by OCD, and current estimates are that approximately one in 40 adults in the United States, that's about 2.3% of the population, and one in 100 children have OCD. Now, just as a way of a quick definition, OCD is an anxiety disorder in which people have unwanted and repeated thoughts, feelings, images, uh, and sensations, obsessions, and engage in behaviors or mental acts in response to these thoughts or obsessions. Often the person carries out the behaviors to reduce the impact or get rid of the obsessive thoughts, but this is uh, something that only brings temporary relief. Not performing the obsessive rituals can cause great, great anxiety. A person's level of OCD can be any Anywhere from mild to severe, but if left untreated, it can limit his or her ability to function at work or school or even to lead a comfortable existence at home or around others. And I know about this because I too have OCD. And by the way, that introduction came to you by way of psychology today. But talking about OCD, another person who has OCD and our very special guest, it's Chrissy Hodges. Chrissy Hodges is a mental health advocate and public speaker on obsessive compulsive disorder, mental illness, and stigma reduction surrounding mental health. She's the author of the book, Pure OCD, The Invisible Side of Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. She works with individuals providing peer support and consultations for referrals and resources for OCD treatment. She sits on the Colorado Advisory Board for Mental Health Standards and Regulations. She's also a commissioner on the Colorado Suicide Prevention Commission. And and Chrissy is an American ambassador for the Shaw Mind Foundation based in the United Kingdom. She is a crisis intervention team presenter for the Denver Sheriff's Department and as well the recipient of the 2017 Advocacy Hero Award by the International OCD Foundation, something that you better believe she has earned. Chrissy, thanks so much for being on with us today. Thank you, Dr. Jeff, for having me on the show. And I'm happy to share my experience with obsessive compulsive disorder. This disorder showed up for me when I was eight years old. I went from a normal, everyday kid, functioning normally, playing Atari, riding bikes, to all of a sudden being bombarded with obsessions and performing compulsions that I didn't even know I was doing. My first fear was emetophobia, which is the fear of vomiting, and this fear consumed me. I had no idea what was going on, and I was performing rituals as an eight-year-old 24-7, such as avoidance, rumination, um, mental, mental checking, things of that nature. <clears throat> In my mind, I didn't want to tell anybody. I was really embarrassed about this fear, and so I made up a story in my head as an eight-year-old to cope. What I did was, I was very religious at the time. I was in the South, my father is a minister, and I created the story in my mind that maybe God is punishing me for something, mm -hmm. and I've done something wrong. And that's why I have these bad thoughts. This is called scrupulosity when it comes to obsessive compulsive disorder, where religion becomes intertwined in your thoughts and your rituals. So I began doing prayer rituals, doing rumination, thinking to myself, what is it that I've done wrong that I need to ask forgiveness for? And this went on for me 
for years. So, so let me ask you, and, and we'll take it a step at a time. Okay. When you had this fear of vomiting, um, what did that exactly feel like for you? And when would that affect you during the day? What were you doing? Were you at school? Were you playing with other kids? The onset of it was I was sitting in my classroom. It was right after lunch. I remember the exact moment, exact feeling, everything. And a kid in my class, he got sick, which happens a lot of time in elementary school. And it had happened to me several times before in the past years I had been sick my sister had been sick before it never bothered me but this day I experienced an absolute reaction of panic my I started to I couldn't get my breath it felt like the walls were closing in my hands were sweaty it felt like impending doom and as as that panic went through me I fell to the floor and I couldn't move. It was, it was as if I was paralyzed. And it took me doing these breathing rituals to be able to get my senses back and to be able to finally function. And it scared the living daylights out of me. Did that other child, was that child throwing up? Yes, he had thrown up right beside my desk. Okay. And so now when you're experiencing this as a child and I, and I can understand how that can be really terrifying because what I think people need to understand especially people who don't have this sort of illness but folks I'm, I'm asking you to look back when you've had too much to drink or maybe you've had too much to eat or maybe you've gotten a flu or something you know that feeling of throwing up uh, yeah you feel better afterwards but before it happens that retching that you have the actual physical pain of throwing up, especially when there's nothing in your stomach. You see stars and that you're going to pass out. That's the worst feeling in the world. So I need people to really understand that. And so I guess, Chrissy, my question to you, did this interfere in your eating, just having snacks or, or regular meals? This did not as much affect those behaviors as I was dealing with the mental compulsions. One of the things that individuals do that have this type of OCD, which by the way, it's nicknamed pure OCD um, as a community name. Mm -hmm. This is what, what people experience are mental rituals that we don't even know that we're doing. In other words, to, to get through it, are you saying? Yes. In response to the heightened anxiety, it feels imperative to do a compulsion to get that anxiety to come down. There's also another component to this, and this was true for me. I did not want anyone to know what was going on in my brain. I felt ashamed, I felt embarrassed, I was so scared to tell my parents. And so I made sure all signs that this was going on were not visible to anyone around me. And so if it affected my eating in any way, it may have just, had just been, I'm feeling nauseous, or if I had eaten something and had vomited afterwards, I would never eat that particular food again. And, and I can understand that um, you didn't want to share this with others because, you know, at that age, you're looking at peer uh, relationships. It's important to be like everyone else. You don't want to be different uh, than the other kids. And also that you felt that you were being punished by God. And yes. so that's something hard that's pretty difficult. Uh, tough to share with your parents. Tell us about some of the rituals you went through in order to either avoid the feeling of vomiting or to get through it as quickly as possible. Most of the rituals <clears throat> were in response to feeling like I was exposed to it. So if I were to see, let's say, the janitor in my school, I was terrified to go near the janitor just in case that janitor had just cleaned up vomit. And maybe mm. they had germs on or on or, or near them. And so I would, let's just say, I would walk all the way around the school in order to avoid the janitor instead of just walking by the janitor to get to my classroom. Other things that I would do, definitely the prayer ritual was a big piece for me. I would do things kind of that that seemed more OCD ish <laughs> at night I had a, a routine I needed to go through if I did not complete that routine meaning pulling the bed back the way it should I felt like it should the just right feeling closing my eyes at the same time when the clock struck a certain time saying a prayer in exact order I believed if I did not do that correctly that someone might vomit the next day Things of that nature, but probably the biggest one other than avoidance um, of areas and people that I thought might vomit are, <clears throat> was the rumination piece. And this is where I would go over and over in my head. If I had been 
exposed. And this could be anything from seeing a splat on the ground and not knowing what it was. It could be coffee or whatever, but my mind immediately sees that splat, believes it might be vomit. I might be contaminated and I might vomit. So I would start to ruminate and think how long until I get sick. Is my stomach feeling nauseous? Which of course would then manifest physical symptoms. And, and so I have to ask you, and, and I know I'm being almost a, a micro analyst, but I think this is so fascinating uh, in that I believe all of us have some degree of OCD. Uh, it's when it becomes a functional uh, disorder for you that, of course, you, you are diagnosable. Um, that contamination from the vomit, what, what kind of contamination did you think you would have? germs, bacteria? <laughs> so I, I believe that if I was contaminated by the germs, that I would, I would end up vomiting. I so see. It wasn't as much of a fear of germs as if I catch this and then I'm going to vomit. I had a kind of a 72 hour thing. I don't know, in my head as an eight year old, I thought there, the incubation period must be 72 hours. So if I was exposed, I would count hours up until, and then feel like I was in the clear. And I'd like to also comment, I think that in, in regards to the, everybody has a degree of OCD, I actually believe everybody has obsessions and compulsions, but it's the D, it's the disorder. Right. It takes it to the other side. And I think right. that a lot of people um, think that they have obsessive compulsive disorder when they're just organizing things, but, you know, the diagnostic criteria, of course, as you know, comes to it's disturbing in your life, it's distressing, it takes up hours and hours of your day. Um, so I thought that might be important to mention. Yeah, that's a very good point to make. So now, it seemed like as difficult as it was for you to go through all of this, well, let me ask you this. How did you do as far as school having to manage this huge OCD disorder and still get through school and have friendships. Were those things affected? Well, as I moved into my teenage years, I started to develop really dark, darker fears. So um, very common for OCD are intrusive thoughts of a sexual or violent or blasphemous nature. These are unwanted thoughts that people get that scare them. We start to try to figure out the why. Why am I having these thoughts? Is there any truth behind it? Which, of course, there isn't, but our brains tell us there might be. So that's why. So, we what, what were some of those thoughts you started having? And, and I find it fascinating as a psychologist, uh, even though you uh, are, in fact, also a, a really important expert on this topic. But now we're talking about going from adolescence to teenage years, the development yeah. of sexuality, right? Yeah. And so it's it's now you start having these sorts of uh, blasphemous sexual thoughts. Tell us a little bit about those thoughts, if you would. So very common themes that occur for individuals with these and myself are going to be, you will have an intrusive thought of, what if I'm gay? Did I turn gay? Or in, in a, an easy manifestation of that could be, I'm hanging around friends and I look at a girlfriend, I go, wow, she looks really pretty today. Why did I just think that? Do I, do I think she's pretty because I, did I just turn gay? It has nothing to do with homophobia. It's just an intrusive thought that probably anybody and everybody gets, but for someone with OCD, you get that intrusive thought and then you think, why did I just have that thought? What's the meaning behind it? As you know, Dr. Jeff, the more you try to figure out these questions, the deeper you get into that rabbit hole. And for us, we would do compulsions when the anxiety would get too high from the intrusive thought. Other common, Sexual intrusive thoughts could be fear of being attracted to a family member, fear of turning into a pedophile, fear of having sexual thoughts about a religious figure. And on the other side of that are violent intrusive thoughts, fear that you are capable of hurting someone. What if I wake up and I turn into a, a mass murderer and I snap and murder people? What if I hurt my family? What if I rape someone? What if I rape my partner? things of that nature, they're terrifying, unwanted, intrusive thoughts. And while the therapy, ERP, teaches you to just let the thoughts be there until you know that you can do that, it is absolute torture. It's 24 seven trying to solve an unsolvable question. And where did it go from there? Because I know that there've been other variations uh, to your OCD. Where, where, where did you I, I was going to say, where did you allow it to go? But it's not even like you allowed it to go. Where did it go 
on its own because a lot of this is uncontrollable. To kind of circle back to the earlier question, once I started having these really dark, scary, intrusive thoughts, Dr. Jeff, that is when I upped the game of I don't want anyone to know. So I became this perfect example to the world outside, almost like ironclad. No one's going to know what's going on in my head. So I created a huge social network. I was an athlete. I was a star student. I got a full ride to college. I was on the cross country team in college. I did not want anyone to know what was going on. I felt so much fear and shame and embarrassment. So as far as socially and grades, it did not affect it. However, I do feel like I was lucky that it didn't affect it, but it also was part of my compulsions to be able to put on that facade for everyone. How did this affect your relationships, Chrissy? Now we're talking about, you know, at the time, even though you're still very young, of course, but at the time, here's this young woman trying to make a way in the world, trying to be part of the community, trying to be that shining star in her family. How did this begin to affect your relationships? As far as family, um, you know, I had, I had a loving family, but it, it definitely, I felt it was the burden of shame. It was the burden of guilt. If they only knew what, who I was and, and what I was inside this monster that I am, they would be so disappointed in me. Um, in relationships, friendships, you know, early relationships, teenage love, um, I was able to have them, but I felt extremely lonely. I could be in a room full of people and I could know everyone's name and they could know my name. And I felt like I was the only one there. I felt like I couldn't connect to people on a deeper level. No one will ever know who I am because they don't know this huge secret that I carry. And so I felt very alone and isolated. So I have to tell you with uh, my OCD, I have OCD. I also have hypochondriasis and we know sometimes they go yeah. together as they did with you. Yes. The fear of, uh, you know, getting the germs from the vomit as well. I have generalized anxiety disorder. I have been somewhat lucky in that I've been able at times to make a joke about it. Like you, uh, I've talked about it a lot uh, in the media. I wear it as a, a badge of courage that I make it through every day. Prayer helps me out a lot. But I've also been able to choose the partners who have had my children, unfortunately for them, just kidding, but who have had my children and who have been very, very supportive. Actually, my partner is a physician. So that's a knife that cuts both ways, Chrissy, in that I can ask her all sorts of questions as to, you know, what are the chances that when I pulled out that hangnail uh, and I had a little bit of bleeding on my finger and then I shook hands with a stranger that I exposed myself to, you know, some sort of disease. And she'll say something like one in one billion. <laughs> and then, of course, when I'm in the middle of an OCD, anxiety, um, hypochondriasis attack, I only focus on that one <laughs> in the billion, right? But yes. I guess my point here is that I've had people who've been very supportive to me as far as lovers, sexual partners, people mm -hmm. I've been married to. What has been your experience with your romantic relationships and your OCD? I currently am with my partner, Sean, and he is amazing and supportive. And I am blessed to have someone like him in my life who just gets it. He knows what to do when I'm having OCD symptoms, not to exacerbate it, but to help do exposure response prevention with me, not to give me reassurance, things of that nature, even though I desperately want it. Um, <clears throat> so not to get too complex, it took me many, many years after I attempted suicide because of OCD, I almost died. Mm. Um, I was, uh, luckily I survived. I was able to get effective treatment, exposure response prevention therapy. And, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Yes. Okay. And I guess the best way to put it is I had, so I was carrying so much grief and stigma from my entire experience. And I think that oftentimes we don't give enough credit to the burden that people carry around of stigma when they go mm -hmm. through something as traumatic as a mental mm -hmm. illness, a suicide attempt, anything, treatment, diagnosis, all of the trauma that comes with that. So for many years, Dr. Jeff, 
after my diagnosis and successful treatment, I didn't feel like I deserved love. I didn't feel like anyone would want to be with anyone like someone like me. This I felt like damaged goods. Who's going to want to be with someone, especially with the nature of my thoughts? What if people know that I had these sexual intrusive thoughts? What if they believe them and they don't think I have OCD? How is anybody going to accept me? So working through that process, which is a lot of what I talk about in my advocacy, the grief that you experience afterwards to be able to learn to love yourself with the illness and despite the illness, I went through that for about 13, 14 years and I was not in great relationships, great people. I'm not saying that they were not great men, um, but I, I wasn't, I didn't believe that I deserved the kind of love because I didn't love myself. And finally was able to work through all of that many years after going through the entire cycle of grieving over what I'd been through. And then I was lucky to be able to find someone like Sean. And you see this uh, look of contentment on my face and I'll tell you why. Again, as a psychologist, I completely understand uh, what you're saying here. And I wanna break that down in layman's terms for our audience because a lot of them may have some issues with obsessions, some with compulsions, some with a combination of both, and those, of course, with actual OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. So uh, Chrissy is a real shero, um, and so like she has gotten help, and we're going to talk about the help that she was able to get and what she's doing. We want you to reach out. We want you to get help. If you have OCD, you know, you can manage this. Uh, some people can even get through it. Uh, I manage it. Chrissy manages it. Uh, it's become my old friend. Hello, OCD, my old friend. Um, but it's a friend that I don't let intrude in my life as often as he or she may want to. And I actually use it sometimes as a superpower. And, you know, uh, I want to address that. Ricky Jackson, my intern, remind me to uh, talk about that, the superpower of OCD. Um, and Chrissy, you know where I'm going with that. Uh, and if you don't, I'm going to go there with you in a minute. But go there the with me in a minute. <laughs> yes, and we will. And the important thing is you have to reach out. You have to get help. You can manage this. You can get through it. You don't have to suffer with it. You can manage it. So uh, we're going to put a lot of resources out there for you. Chrissy, you're going to give out some information. Shane is going to put some stuff on our website. But here's what I was talking about as far as this, uh, why I was smiling. Number one, what you said, Chrissy. After going through the process and getting through the process and finally being able to manage it, there was then a mourning period of the years that you felt you had lost, uh, of all of that anxiety and guilt that you felt after going through that. And that's something you don't see in the textbooks, that once you get better, now you have to go through the process of reclaiming your life and making sense as to why all of this happened. And yes. that brings me to the point of the superpower. I've often seen my OCD as a superpower because it kept me out of trouble. It kept me from getting involved in sexual relationships that probably were not healthy because I was so afraid of getting a disease. So it was a superpower. But where it consumed me was when I couldn't stop thinking about it and I wasn't even able to get into any relationships at times because of that fear of getting some sort of an illness through sex. Where was that superpower for you with your OCD? Was it ever a superpower? Did it ever help you in any way? No. <laughs> Damn. It, Damn. She said I, no. No. I, yes. <laughs> and I, and but you I, understand, but you understand where it helped me. I understand the if I did not have OCD or these fears, what could have happened? I yeah. absolutely understand that. Um, I, now, but let me segue, I do love my life. I connect to people on a different level because I look at the world now through a lens of human suffering. I would not mm. have had that if it weren't for OCD. I would not have I would not, oh, I don't, I don't want to, like, <laughs> there's so much I want to say, but I'm like, Wait, yeah, because you see what's happening here? My OCD is making you admit that it was a superpower no! it changed your life in some way, because if you don't agree, that OCD, I'm, uh, <laughs> so, okay, I, I think I just have trouble using it as the word superpower, but 
I am grateful for the life Meaning. that I, I am grateful for the life that I had because yeah. of what I went through. Yes. So I can't agree. When I look back on the suffering that I went through, sometimes what I still go through, mm -hmm. there is nothing that I want for this OCE to be gone. I hate it. And I, you know, I, it sends me right back to being eight years old when it first hit. Yes. Yes. For me. Yes. However, if I hadn't have gone through what I did, if I didn't have OCD, I would not be able to connect with people worldwide and bring them to help. Show them that there is hope. Show them that recovery is possible for anybody. It is the greatest honor of my life to do what I am doing now. So I would not be doing this without OCD. However, if I had to choose- whether There goes I your OCD. Back, there goes your OCD. You're <laughs> bringing it back to the point, yes. <laughs> So I do try to, as, as much as I meet people where they're at and empathize what they're going through, I do try to inspire hope. At some point in your life, you will see that this not can be a benefit, but that great things can come out of this. And the biggest one I would say, Dr. Jeff, is the ability when you understand human suffering, when you understand the depths that you can get to, your worldview changes and you connect to people and the world on a different level. And that is what I'm grateful for because of my experience with OCD. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm grateful for you that you've been able to turn this pain into power and through helping yourself, you've been able to help so many other people. And so let's talk about that, Chrissy. When did you finally decide, listen, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of dealing with this OCD. Um, <laughs> how did you come to that and let's talk about how you're able to now get that out to everyone to help them change their lives. But what was your process? When I was getting effective treatment for OCD, I was sitting on the psychology steps at my college and I looked up into the sky and I said, one day. It's a bird, it's a plane. You see, it was a superpower. It's OCD. Just OC, it's OCD. But go ahead, you're looking up, yes. I said, maybe one day I can share my story of sexual intrusive thoughts and help other people. And my OCD gave me the smack down. Oh no, you're not. Mm. Nobody's gonna believe you. Everybody will judge you. Never say a word about this. You're not Dr. ready Jeff. for it. Uh, I'm gonna punish you and make it even worse. Yes. And so I spent the next 13 years in silence. I often say to people, I don't know which one was worse, the 12 years before I was diagnosed and treated or the 13 years after, where keeping that to myself and having that anger and shame fester inside of me. It wasn't until I was around 32, 33, about six, six seven years ago, I relapsed. I had, I was starting to have violent intrusive thoughts, um, intrusive thoughts about relationships and I was scared and I remembered, oh, OCD is still there. It's never going away. But that's when I decided to write, it takes me about three, three weeks or at that point to get back on my feet, um, get, you know, do some tr therapy and get back on my medication, stuff like that. And, and, let's, and let's remind people very quickly that interestingly enough, OCD is almost like an addiction because you get so used to it that what is life without it, Ricky? This is very important where Chrissy it is. Told. It's very and important. You get relapses. I also get relapses where it takes me, a, you said three weeks, it takes me about three weeks when I have a bad, really bad OCD attack. And Ricky, show your face for just a second. Uh, Ricky is my intern. I, I want to get back to your point. Show your face here. Okay, that's our, that's our intern, Ricky Jackson, everyone. Ricky, you saw me when I was having an OCD attack right in the middle of a taping of a TV show, and I, it, it took everything in my power, Chrissy, to be able to get through that TV show. So he saw that. But anyway, so you were, you were having this relapse, and... I had to still run a business. I owned a clothing store at the time, and, and so I thought... I'm just gonna write the story of my life. So I typed it in three weeks to remind myself, you have OCD, you can get through this, you've done it before, you can do it again. And then I thought, wow, that would be a great book. Wow, and there it is. And from that point, Dr. Jeff, this was the biggest transformation of my life. Mm -hmm. I thought to myself, I was done grieving and I had a choice. I can either learn to love myself 
I can learn to embrace that I have this illness or I can continue hating my life, hating myself and living a life full of anger and sadness and, mm. and shame and grief. And I, I said, no, for the second time in my life, I told my OCD, no, you're not going to control me. I'm going to do what I want because I do what I want. And I started speaking out. I, I learned how to speak. I slowly started speaking about the really tough topics like the sexual violent intrusive thoughts. I started working with Matt Miles here in Denver. I worked as an ERP coach. So I don't do actual ERP, exposure response prevention, but he taught me how to coach people as they're going through therapy because it's tough therapy. And what we saw was having someone there to support someone going through the therapy who's done it before, that peer support was invaluable. From there, I decided that peer support was what I wanted to do. I worked for a BHO here in Denver area and I became a peer support and I, I worked in the mental institution here at Fort Logan as a peer support specialist. Oh, and I just, I just loved it. It was my calling. And just this past year, I went out on my own through my advocacy on mostly my YouTube channels. People find me, they, they hear the story, they know they're not alone. They reach out to me. I help connect them to therapists who can actually treat OCD through a consultation. And then I support people through peer support to normalize what they're going through, let them know there's hope. So, so, uh, and, and, and I know one of the things that you talk about, and, and you'll tell us in a second where people can find you on YouTube um, to get, to open the gateway, if you will, to yes. getting help. Exposure peer response, this sort of treatment, what exactly does that do? So exposure response prevention is evidence-based treatment for OCD. And what this does is it's slowly, I mean, this is just, I know you could go a lot more technical than this, but I'm going to tell you what it was like for me. No, let's, let's break it down in layman's terms for people yep. watching because people really need something right now who are going through this and they can learn more about it in your YouTube channel. I'm sure they can learn about it in your book, Pure OCD, The Invisible Side of, of Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, which they can get on Amazon, Kindle, and so on. But tell us about this uh, exposure response prevention. So ERP is part of cognitive behavioral therapy. And I was lucky, again, I, I always just look back and I feel like I was so lucky to be, to get the right treatment, to get a mm -hmm. specialist, to have a family that could help support that. Um, I did, I found Dr. Stephen Philipson in New York. He is an OCD specialist. We did phone therapy. This was back in the day. This is like right. 1998. I didn't even Now we're doing Skype, like FaceTime and so on, but yes. yes. I would just hear this voice over the phone that would cause me anxiety once a week. And <laughs> I had no idea who he was. But what he did is he slowly, each week, would give me homework on how to expose myself to these fears. So, for instance, it's just like having a phobia. And in order to overcome having a phobia, you slowly expose yourself to that phobia so your brain can normalize and desensitize and say, oh, we actually don't have to fear this. So for example, if someone's having the fear that I am, you know, fear of turning gay or something of that nature, what a therapist will do, will take whatever your compulsions are. So avoidance, if you're avoiding this specific area because you had an anxiety attack there at some point, because of the fear. Again, it's all about the anxiety, not about the theme. The therapist will say, I want you to go sit at that area 30 minutes a day and rate your anxiety. And the person experiencing it is like, no, because they've been avoiding it because they're so terrified of the anxiety. But what you find is if you are doing the homework and you're committed and you do it every single day, every day you go to that place, the anxiety gets a little bit lower. It doesn't and, and, it, and, and it reminds me of systematic desensitization where we Absolutely. also do relaxation, getting there while you're being exposed uh, to this thing that you dread. But you do it slowly, stepwise, yes. correct? Yes. And typically, an OCD therapist will create a hierarchy with you. You'll start really small and mm -hmm. you work your way up the hierarchy. For me, Dr. Jeff, I guess it took about four, three, four, five weeks for my brain to start believing okay, we actually don't have to be afraid of this anymore. Oh, I get it. It's behaviors. You just need to, you need to just change your behavior in response to the intrusive thoughts and the anxiety. So for a lot of people, they'll go, well, I'll just go expose myself then. It's very important to have a professional that knows how to do this because the important piece is the response 
prevention. That is not doing any compulsions. That's the willingness to let the anxiety spike and be able to sit in it because that's where you learn how it works and how to safely change that behavior in your brain. And that's why you believe it's really important that if you go see a therapist for OCD, they should have the experience of working with it. And I offer that to my patients as well as, of course, I've been through it too. And and just a quick uh, uh, comment, by the way, and I know you did not mean it in this particular way. There should never be any fear of thinking that you're gay. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. We're, we're talking about something else completely different as far as compulsive thoughts and, and so on. So of Absolutely. course that was not meant to uh, no. insult anyone in any way. Conversely from that, there's right. also the fear of an OCD fear would be someone who's living a homosexual lifestyle also, oh my gosh, what if I turn straight? So mm. that is also common. So I just am using that because it is one of the most I know. common fears. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So that, that's really great. So Chrissy, tell me, how can people who really want to take that first step, that very first step to be able to manage their OCD, to have some sort of a breakthrough, to live a life where they can be happy again? What do they need to do? I would say doing some evidence-based research. There's a lot of stuff out there that is not accurate about OCD. So going to sites like ocdonline.com, ocdbaltimore.com, finding the experts, the people who are treating people every single day for OCD, reading their content, finding out first, the first step is hope. The first mm -hmm. step is knowing that you are not alone and that you can get control of that. Mm -hmm. That is the first step. The second step is finding the right therapist. Now, I'm going to say there aren't very many out there that actually do effective treatment for OCD. I mean, there are, but in, relatively in the grand scheme of things. Um, but making sure they have success stories, making sure they're doing exposure response prevention, also supplemental treatment like acceptance commitment therapy, mindfulness, things of that nature. Just hanging on to that hope. It's a tough journey, and sometimes it seems like Sometimes it seems like, well, what, what if I go through the treatment and it doesn't work? What if I go through the treatment and the fears are real? Reading success stories, seeing that people can get better from this and that you are no different. And, and, and it's important, that point that you made, getting the therapist who actually has the experience, don't be afraid. Ask that Yes. therapist do you do this sort of exposure therapy do you do systematic desensitization do you do cognitive behavioral using very specific relaxation techniques in order to get that exposure to whatever the trauma may be so you can get better do you do the behavioral work so do your homework and make sure you get someone who can yes. be very specific about what it is that they do. And I would also say uh, your book, Pure OCD, The Invisible Side of Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, uh, people can order that. That will certainly open up a window as to what Chrissy has gone through, what many of you are able to identify with, because we all have the stories. We're all part of that tribe who have OCD. And therefore, as you saw with even the things that Chrissy and I talked about, the approximately three weeks to get over an attack. Isn't that fascinating? How we all share some of these very common things that are part of OCD. So make sure you read a book. And where can people connect with you on Facebook to start getting this info, uh, information and stories of hope, Chrissy? So you can connect with me on Facebook at Treatment for OCD. Um, that's where I post a lot of great content, but also how, that also will tell you how to get in touch with me if you need referrals or peer support. Instagram and Twitter, my handle is Pure O Chrissy, P-U-R-E-O Chrissy. Chrissy, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thank you for being so courageous and sharing your story with us. Uh, I do believe that you are giving hope upon hundreds of thousands of folks who are dealing with OCD, obsessive compulsive of disorder, uh, what you've been able to do for yourself, what you're doing for the world, and what we are now inspired to do because of your incredible story. Well, I just have to say thank you, thank you, and thank you, Chrissy. 
Thank you to you, Dr. Jeff. It is such a pleasure to be able to talk and chat with you and hear more about who you are and what your experience is. An honor to be here. All right, and we're gonna have you back again. Thank you, Chrissy Hodges. She's a mental health advocate, public speaker on obsessive compulsive disorder, managing her own, and she talks about stigma reduction. And don't forget, you can catch her book, Pure OCD, The Invisible Side of Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. You can get it anywhere on the internet. All right, folks, uh, I hope that we've given you some really great information on OCD and are giving you the impetus, the motivation to go ahead and tackle your own OCD. You know you deserve to be happy. Don't forget, you can follow me on Instagram at Dr. Jeff Gardier, Twitter at Dr. Jeff Gardier, and Facebook at Dr. Jeff Gardier. Folks, Remember, let's make America not just great again, but let's make America kind again. Have a great day and an amazing week. Shane, take us away. Well, thank you, Dr. Jeff. We're certainly looking forward to next week's show. And if you'd like to learn more about the Dr. Jeff show, his workshops, or Zubia Live, make sure to follow us on our social media at Zubia Live. And remember, if you have a health and wellness story or topic that affects you, and you'd like to share it with our Zubia Live community, make sure to download our app at zubialive.com or your favorite app location. But for now, we'd like to say thank you for watching and we'll see you again soon.